It is Friday, so of course it is time for our national town hall with a man I think of as America's senator, although the good citizens of Vermont, I was one of them for a decade, know well he is their senator, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders. Bernie, uh, welcome. Great to be with you, Tom. Thanks for joining us. I understand you're at a school in New Hampshire today. I am at St. Anselm's College in Manchester, New Hampshire, and uh, as soon as our program ends, I'm going to be speaking uh, at a rally uh, with uh, senior citizen organizations uh, to make sure that uh, Social Security is not cut and that we protect Medicare and that we protect Medicaid uh, as well. There is right now a massive uh, right-wing effort uh, to ultimately uh, make devastating cuts uh, in Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and at the same time, as you know, give huge tax breaks uh, to the wealthiest people in this country, and I'm, I'm here in New Hampshire today uh, to do everything I can to prevent that from happening. And and what uh, your thoughts on on you know the president's speech and on the DNC and 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 for that matter to stay with Social Security, his his brief mention of it, whereas uh, several years ago he was calling for lifting the cap, which would easily fix everything. Right. Well, that's one of the points that I'm going to be making in my remarks is that four years ago the president was very strong on Social Security. He challenged McCain. He made the correct point that McCain would cut, would have cut Social Security. And the president said, I'm not going to do that. And the solution is to lift the cap on taxable income, start at 250000 not even at 110000 And then to, uh, and if you do that, you'll have enough revenue coming in to make Social Security solvent for the next 75 years. That was the president's proposal. Uh, I liked it so much, I introduced legislation to do just that. Uh, but what concerns me is that four years have come and gone, and we're trying to get the president to speak out on Social Security, to tell us where he is on the issue, and uh, we haven't been successful. And I fear very much uh, that after the election, uh, there may be, in fact, uh, even if Obama wins, uh, cuts to Social Security, unless unless we are aggressive and make sure... Uh, that we rally the American people and say, no, you can't, you can't do that. Yeah. And this, and, and Social Security affects everyone. I mean, literally, the the twenty year olds listening right now, the thirty year olds, the forty year olds, Social Security is a multi million dollar insurance program against disability for all of them. No, that's right. Social Security um, impacts about fifty five million Americans. Uh, most of them are seniors who receive uh, retirement benefits. But what Social Security also does is it provides substantial help uh, to people who have disabilities. Uh, it provides help to widows and orphans. In fact, uh, about 36 million retired workers receive Social Security, 8.5 million disabled workers, 4.3 million children, and 4.4 million widows uh, and widowers, and 2.5 million spouses. So it really does provide dignity uh to tens of millions of people and what we you know i think one of the problems with regard to social security tom is that we just take it for granted it's been around for 77 years during all of that time it has paid out every nickel owed to every eligible american in good times and in very bad times uh but it is being unmercifully attacked right now uh by the right wing uh and it is being attacked under the guise of deficit reduction we need to cut social security to move to a deficit reduction when the truth is that the social security hasn't contributed a nickel to the deficit because it is funded by the payroll tax and furthermore uh it it has a 2.7 trillion dollar surplus so the fight right now is to make it clear that social security works has worked is working today and with modest changes uh, can be a solvent for the next 75 years, and that it is just enormously important. So those folks who want to raise the Social Security age, those folks who want to convert uh, Medicare into a voucher program uh, so that in 10 years you give some senior citizen, and this is what the Ron, uh, this is what the Ryan plan was all about, you give some senior citizen who is 70 years of age, you give them an $8,000 check, and then you say, well, good luck. You go out to some private insurance company, and we're sorry you have cancer. We're sorry you have uh, emphysema. You have heart disease. Uh, and you walk into any insurance company you want. And, Tom, you just, just think about what that insurance company says to somebody 
when they know they're going to be running up a bill of tens and tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they're getting an $8,000 check for a, a, a policy. So it, it, to my mind, certainly uh, one of the many reasons that Romney and Ryan have got to be defeated uh, is their attacks against Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. But we have got to do everything that we can to make sure that uh, President Obama and the Democrats remain uh, strong on these issues. Uh, the other point that I would make, in having watched these conventions, and I don't know that everybody is fully aware it, to what degree uh, the Republican Party has moved to the extreme right. You know, uh, Tom, you, you lived in Vermont for a while, and for many years, Vermont had governors and senators who were Republicans, but they were moderate Republicans. Yeah, they Jim were Jeffers. concerned about the environment. They were concerned about education. Uh, what you have right now is a party dominated by right-wing extremists who, in this particular moment, when we have the most unequal distribution of wealth and income in the modern history of America, the worst in the world, they want to give more tax breaks to people who don't need it and cut back not only on Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, but education, uh, nutrition programs, and so forth. And then furthermore, and, and this really blows my mind because I'm on the Environmental Committee and the, and the Energy Committee, you have a situation where virtually the entire scientific community was written about global warming, have peer-reviewed articles on global, uh, on global warming, uh, acknowledge that A, global warming is real, it is significantly caused by man-made activities, and C, it is already wrecking havoc on uh, our planet. And then you have the guy who is the leader, leading person on the environmental committee uh, for the Republicans writing and, and, and believing that global warming is a hoax. It's a hoax perpetrated by the United Nations, uh, the Hollywood elite, and Al Gore. And this is what uh, Senator Jim, Jim Inhofe uh, actually believes. Uh, you have the Republican Party today uh, coming up with a platform plank on women's reproductive rights, which is really, really just absolutely astounding, saying, and, and they want a constitutional amendment to make this happen, that if a woman gets raped, uh, she must have, must have the baby, even, even if it endangers her health and her life. And to me, that is just uh, so extreme. Uh, it's hard to believe that in the year 2012, a major party would be proposing that. Uh, you have the Republican Party not only supporting Citizens United, that disastrous Supreme Court decision, but, you know, reaping you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars from billionaires and, and corporations to fund their campaigns. Uh, a Republican Party today, which is engaged aggressively in voter suppression, making it harder for low-income people, for older people uh, to participate in the political process, uh, and on and on it goes. So uh, to me, uh, what this election is about, most significantly, is defeating right-wing extremism and doing our best uh, to develop that strong grassroots progressive movement that we need uh, to make sure that uh, the president and, and, and Democrats in general uh, fight aggressively uh, for the needs of working families, for women, for the environment, for our kids, for our seniors. Yeah. And and this comes from movement politics. This, it, this comes not... only from movement politics. I mean, I think there is a lesson to be learned in the progressive movement from the success, the enormous success of the Tea Party uh, effort, which is just a few years old and has taken what was traditionally a, a, a center-right party, a, a moderately conservative party, uh, to an extreme right-wing party. Yeah. And uh, there's less to be learned there. It's, it's amazing. And it was, you know, Fred Koch who funded it and, and got Barry Goldwater back in the 60s, and now it's, the, now it's his sons who are making it happen today. It's just incredible. Senator Bernie Sanders on the line with us. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour. More of your calls for Bernie right after this. This is the Tom Hartman Program. And check out Bernie's website, sanders.senate.gov. And you can sign his uh, petition there. And we'll, and, and also tomhartman.com. We'll be right back. And welcome back. Uh, Tom Hartman here with you. Senator Sanders on the line with us. And Ron in Cokeville, Oregon, watching us on Direct TV on Free Speech TV. Ron, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Wow, Senator Sanders. First, a little attaboy. You know, am I there? Yep, right here. Uh, um, 
in in a world of snarling, terrible, feral, feral pigs, you're a shining light. God, I wish there were more senators and representatives like you. Thank you. But very anyway, much. I have a question: the Mitt Romney health care plan, and what he plans on on having for all of us out here that are going to be on some sort of health care plan. Now, is that plan better or worse? than the plan he has for his dancing horse. <laughs> well, I, I'm really not totally aware of the plan that he has for his dancing horse. But, Mike, in all seriousness, uh, people who own very valuable horses spend a whole lot of money uh, keeping those horses healthy. Uh, and I expect that that horse will get very fine health care. But under the Romney plan, which, among other things, uh, ends the Affordable Care Act, uh, which would make devastating cuts in Medicaid, throwing millions of children off of health insurance, forcing middle-class families to figure out how they're going to take care of their parents who may have Alzheimer's or serious illnesses and need nursing home care. Uh, that plan is an absolute, total uh, disaster, and we've got to do everything that we can, not only to oppose that plan, but, of course, to make sure that Romney doesn't have the chance to... Uh, to implement it in the White House. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Frank in Cambridge, Mass. You're on the air with uh, Senator Sanders. Thanks for watching Free Speech TV. Well, thank you for taking the call. Uh, uh, thank you for Bernie Sanders. But you're like a voice in the wilderness to me. I am from Cambridge, and I'm 67. I just retired. My brother is 74, and he had retired four years ago. But w my question is, I heard that since John Roberts, the Chief Justice, declared that Obamacare was a tax, that if the Republicans gain control of the Senate and they win the presidency, what they're going to do is the first hundred days they're going to, Mitch McConnell, John Boehner, and Romney are going to meet, and they're going to say that Social Security Medicare, Medicaid, Obamacare are a tax, and they can change them with 51 votes. My question is, I've talked to my sister and my brother, who you know, both retired for what, before me, and they're already, you know, they're outraged about this. They would... Yeah, they Frank, let's, let's let Bernie answer. Well, we just have 30 Frank seconds. Frank raises uh, an interesting uh, question and one that I think a lot of people are, are, are thinking about, is, is I think most listeners know uh, the Republicans have engaged in an unprecedented level of obstructionism against Obama. They've forced filibuster votes, 60, requiring 60 votes to pass anything on uh, one legislation after another, after another, after another. I think Frank raises uh, the, the question, is there a way within Senate rules uh, to move toward 51 votes rather than 60 votes. Will the Republicans do it? And the answer is there may well be. And it may well be that the Republicans would be more aggressive than the Democrats uh, uh, have been. Let's come back to that right after the break, Bernie. That's all right with you. The Tom Hartman Program is brought to you in part by Solar World, solarworld.com for information on solar electricity. Someone who cares about the welfare of the people, their health, their house, their schools, their jobs, their civil rights and their civil liberties, if that is what they mean by a liberal, then I'm proud to say that I'm a liberal. Welcome back. 21 minutes past the hour. Tom Hartman here with you. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour. Senator Bernie Sanders on the line. And Bernie, we had a caller a few minutes ago who was uh, asking right, if... What Frank was talking about is a provision called budget reconciliation. And under, under the uh, rules, you can get a vote. You can pass legislation with 51 votes uh, if you can argue successfully to the parliamentarian that you're doing budget reconciliation. Uh, do I think that the Republicans will aggressively try to move in that direction if they have a majority in the Senate? I think they will. 
uh, more so than the Democrats. Well, Grover Norquist said this to the Financial Times last week that that they would that they would even take social legislation that had to do with things like abortion or uh, gay marriage. They would figure out a way to make a uh, to put a financial edge on it right. and call it a budget. Well, bill. it's not quite clear, Tom, that they can get away with doing. You know, it's more complicated than uh, Norquist makes it out to be. Yeah. But bottom line here is the Democrats, to my mind have not been anywhere near as aggressive in dealing with, in using the rules to pass legislation. And that's something that has to be changed if uh, the Democrats retain control of the Senate, which I certainly uh, hope will be the case. Yeah. Nick, in Cliffside Park, New Jersey, listening on WWRL in New York City, you are on the air with Senator Bernie Sanders. Thank you, Tom. Senator Sanders, love you. I have to tell you, though, that the way the Democrats have sounded the last three days in this convention, so much heat and light and fire and energy, is the way you've sounded, Senator Sanders, for the past four years. <laughs> they, they, they finally adopted a little bit of your, of your vinegar and your energy. Now, what I'm afraid of or concerned about, I'm not really afraid, I think that Obama can and will win this election. The question is, will it just be a narrow victory and we end up with four more years of the same stuff, the same obstructionism, or will we have a kind of landslide, which is what we need? And if we don't get that landslide, then we better damn well get, be sure we get it in 2014, because unless there is a progressive majority, and a, an aggressively progressive majority of Democrats in the, in the Congress, no president will have any legislation to sign that's progressive. Well, Mick, let me pick up on your point, and I certainly hope that the president wins and wins with as large a majority as possible and the Democrats retain control of the Senate, and hopefully it's a stretch, but perhaps take, uh, re regain control o over the House. But this is what I think, and, and one of the areas where I have been very critical of the president. Uh, when the president ran last time, he had put together the most effective campaign that I have seen in my lifetime. It was really an extraordinary effort. It was not only inspiring. They had created grassroots networks. People were out knocking on doors. They were using the Internet in an unprecedented way. The day after the election, or at least the day after he was inaugurated, the president kind of detached himself from that grassroots activism. Mick, the way I think, and I hope very much that you know, we do as well as we can in this election, but the bottom line here is the president has got to reconnect with grassroots America, demand that they fight with him for a progressive agenda. We need right now a massive jobs program. That's what we need to rebuild our infrastructure, transform our energy system, put millions of people to work. You know, I know that the Republicans will be vigorously opposed to that. But we can win that fight if millions of people are putting pressure on their Republican congressmen and senators and demanding action. We can, in fact, be aggressive in health care. We can be aggressive in global warming and transforming global warming, in protecting women and their reproductive rights. But you cannot be successful if you're just operating inside the Beltway negotiating with Republicans. The most important point that I can make is the ideas that we espouse on this program, progressive ideas, are supported overwhelmingly by the American people. You go out on any street corner in America, and you ask people, do you think we should cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid and give tax breaks to billionaires? I doubt that 10 or 15% of the people believe in that. Do they believe that we should transform our energy system? People do. So I think we have the people on our side. What we have to do is mobilize those people, get those people involved in the political process. We can then go forward and pass significant uh, progressive legislation. Jim in Chicago, listening on WCPT. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Yeah, it's a pleasure and uh, a real, real honor for talking to both you guys, gentlemen. You. Um, we can, we can. You're right. We need a jobs program to help support our safety net and broaden the tax base, and we need something that's going to Im impact every community uh, across this nation. Uh, not just Wall Street and Main Street, but Elm Street and Ma uh, Maple Street and Oak Street and, uh, and, you know, every community. And we can do that by self-perpetuating our own interests by the use of our tax dollars, uh, given back to the uh, citizens to self-contract work for home improvement and maintenance 
by virtue of a debit card given to homeowners who are paying into earned income, not retired, not on disability. We have other programs for those people, but you can self-perpetuate a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars a year yep. in cycles every year, okay. every two years. Jim, Jim, we have just uh, just thirty well, seconds Jim left here point. before the break, I so mean, let me let me let Bernie the jump area in. That I, what Jim is talking about, the fact is that there are millions and millions of homes that need improvement. And if it's a thousand or three thousand uh, dollars, the material that you buy uh, will create jobs, and you can create jobs uh, having those homes improved. One of the areas, Jim, that we're working on is to help Americans uh, get their homes retrofitted and weatherized. Uh, in my state of Vermont, where the weather gets cold, we put money into weatherization. We're saving people twenty, thirty, fifty percent on their fuel bills. We're cutting greenhouse gas emissions, and we are creating jobs. We should be doing that all over the United States of America. But it's not only homes and buildings. We have a crumbling infrastructure in terms of roads, our bridges, our airports. Our rail system is falling further and further behind the rest of the world. We have old schools out there. There is more than enough work to be You're done. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 866-987-THOM. We'll be back in just a moment with Senator Bernie Sanders and our Brunch with Bernie Hour here on the Tom Hartman Program. And the truth is, it will take more than a few years for us to solve challenges that have built up over decades. It will require common effort, shared responsibility, and the kind of bold, persistent experimentation that Franklin Roosevelt pursued during the only crisis worse than this one. Pick up some phone calls here, so some more phone calls here then. Ron in uh, Kylene, Texas. Am I saying that right, Ron? Uh, it's Kylene, Texas, sir. Kylene. How you doing? Great. You are on the air with Senator Sanders. Yeah, um, the only thing, question I had, I'm a novice to this whole political thing, uh, but I am a hardcore Barack Obama supporter. Uh, I just noticed that everyone was concentrating on this job uh, report that came out uh, saying that it's only created 96,000 jobs uh, and and that uh, uh, was, we went down from 8.3% to 8.1%. It's not that big of a deal. But I'm, I'm thinking about those 96,000 uh, families that are affected by the job and how, how they must feel, you know, with, with knowing that they have worked finally. Right. Uh, and, and it's a sign that the economy, although it is not there yet, there is there's been signs that it is steadily getting better, but we have to stay the course. Uh, I'll take your uh, your remarks off air. Well, thanks, Ron. And I think the point that, that Ron is, is making, which needs to be um, stated over and over again, is yes, it is true. 96,000 96, jobs is not a particularly good job production record for a month. But on the other hand, we have to remember where we were when Bush left office. And while 96,000 jobs is not what we need, we need a lot more, it's a hell of a lot better than losing some 750,000 jobs a month when Bush left office. Uh, it is a heck of a lot better than being in the situation where we were, where not only the American financial system was on the verge of collapse, but the global financial system was on the verge of collapse which would have left uh, would have uh, led to a global depression. So I think Ron's point is yeah, we have enormous economic problems uh, in front of us, no question about it. Real unemployment is close to 15%, not 8.1%, but some job growth is a heck of a lot of a heck of a lot better than massive job loss. Uh, my concern Ron is that I want to hear this president tell us uh, as specifically as he can, how we can create the millions of new jobs uh, that we uh, desperately need so that we can put our people uh, back to work. Jason, watching us live at TomHartman.com in Costa Mesa, California. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Oh, hey, thanks for taking my call. Uh, I want to make an observation first before I get to my point. I think it's interesting that uh, before Bush got elected, it was uh, put out there that he had bankrupt all these companies and a lot of progressives like myself were saying, what's he going to do to the country? And eight years later, the country is broke, and now they want to... He, he did that, of course, through incompetence, bankrupting those companies, and now they want to give us a professional who bankrupts companies for a living. And I'm just wondering how bad it would be after eight years of Romney. But uh, the reason I called uh, is because I think that uh, Democrats and the Progressive Caucus are 
are mismanaging our communication. Um, as you gentlemen know, there's really one problem facing this country, and that's the corporate corruption of our government. And Bernie, you're a, you're a real you're real strong on that, and, and I absolutely appreciate that. But I think that uh, all too often, uh, the Progressive Caucus and Democrats miss the opportunity to pound the point of getting money out of politics, because every single item, every single legislation that Republicans want to argue about, uh, all comes back to getting money out of politics and, and getting businesses uh, and capitalism out of democracy. And, and I think that that's the point that needs to be driven home on everything instead of chasing them around on single item discussions. That's how they win the argument is by having you guys chase them around. On, Jason, on let's toss, toss this and, to the senator here. Well, I, I agree with what Jason said. I mean, in a sentence or a paragraph, uh, the dominant issue of our time is the huge impact that big money has on the political process and the legislative process. And I can give you, and I suspect Jason could as well, a million examples of how big money pushes through legislation, which ends up benefiting the wealthy and the powerful, uh, and hurts working families and, and low-income people. i just give you maybe the most uh, significant example. When the uh, Wall Street folks wanted deregulation and they wanted to do away with uh, Glass-Steagall and other uh, Depression-era uh, Wall Street reform pieces of legislation, they spent over a 10-year period $5 billion. And they did it in a bipartisan way. They had Alan Greenspan and they had Republicans. They had Robert Rubin and they had Democrats. And they got uh, finally was successful uh, in getting Bill Clinton to sign deregulation uh, so that uh, uh, investor-owned banks could merge with commercial banks, could merge with insurance companies. And that act led us to the illegal behavior of Wall Street, which caused the recession we're currently in. So Jason's point is absolutely right. And I have to say, as Jason well knows, Citizens United has made a terrible situation even worse. And what people should appreciate about Citizens United, it's not just that billionaires are buying elections. They also have a very intimidating impact on the legislative process. Because any member of the Senate, any member of the House who is about to vote for a piece of legislation which takes on Wall Street or the drug companies or the private insurance companies has to think in the back of his or her mind, am I going to be punished for that vote? Will I go home in the weekend and find millions of dollars in TV ads attacking me? So big money is, to my mind, the single most significant issue that has got to be addressed. Citizens United made it worse. And the antidote to all of that is, in fact, public funding of elections and the overturning through a constitutional amendment of the Citizens United Supreme Court decision. Victor in Aurora, Illinois, listening to WCPT. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Victor? Hello, Tom. Do you say Victor? Yes, sir. Yes. You're on the air. Um, well, yeah, basically, I just, I, I just have a, a comment and a question. Um, me, personally, when I see someone in the Republican side uh, lying one time, lying two times, lying three times, the first time, you let it go. Second time, to me, that's it, okay? I, I, for me, anyone on that side loses completely credibility at all, and we shouldn't listen to them at all, okay? That's me. Many people are not like that, I guess. Uh, now, when you have someone in power in politics and you give them the power to be in front of a microphone, uh, in front of a camera on, on TV, uh, national um, uh, coverage, and they are lying, lie after lie after lie after lie, and they don't get punished by law. In my opinion, I don't think anything is going to change in this country or in any uh, place in the world as long as the law does not punish these people that are in power in politics where they are lying, completely lying. And so, the, so the question for, for Bernie is what? Right. What can it be done? In well, order I, I tell you, Victor, the answer is more complicated perhaps than, than you would like. And that I don't think you can uh, legally, you know, punish some politician who's not telling the truth. And you're absolutely right. Clearly, part of the Republican agenda, I think Bill Clinton made the point uh, that they're not going to be influenced by fact check. The fact 
checkers. In other words, they will say whatever they want, whether it's true or not. And Victor is absolutely right. That is a very important component of what Republicans do. They simply don't tell the truth. Uh, the way you defeat that, Victor, and it's, it's not easy, uh, is simply to educate and organize to make sure that more and more Americans are engaged in the political process, have a framework, an intellectual framework, and a worldview which enables them to understand what is happening today. And the sad reality is, is that many, many, many millions of Americans are not engaged, and they will vote this way or that way for all kinds of strange reasons. And that takes you also back to the media. Victor mentioned the media. We have talk show radio uh, heavily dominated by right-wing extremism. Uh, the right wing has its very own television network in Fox, uh, and you have other television stations uh, owned by uh, major corporations. So there are a whole lot of huge issues out there that working people feel strongly about that never get discussed. How often does the media say, well, Let's talk about whether we give tax breaks to billionaires or cut Social Security. Let's have a frank discussion about what the scientific community believes about global warming. Let's talk about Wall Street and whether or not Wall Street's business model is based on fraud and whether, in fact, it is appropriate that a handful of giant banks, top six, have assets equivalent to two-thirds of the GDP of the United States of America, writing half the mortgages, two-thirds of the credit cards. Is that a good idea to give so much power to so few people? What about our trade policies, which have cost us millions of decent-paid jobs through NAFTA and CAFTA and permanent normal trade relations with China? Do we have a serious discussion about that? So what I would say to Victor, there's no easy answer to this. And the only answer I know is that we need to educate, we need to organize, we need to have a national discussion, which is not easy. Right now, you know, we have people in my state who are going door to door, door to door, talking to people. We have town meetings on these very issues. So that's, I think, uh, what our challenge and our agenda has got to be. Absolutely. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. It's our national town hall meeting, Brunch with Bernie. 46 minutes past the hour. Back with more of your questions for Senator Sanders. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. And you can check out Bernie's website over at Sanders.Senate.gov. And we'll be back with more of your questions for Senator Bernie Sanders in a brunch with Bernie. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Yeah. Hi, uh, Tom. Uh oh. Bernie, hey, uh, hey, on this right here, salary cap, or, you know, biker cap, Yeah. why, why can't you we raise that up? I mean, why is it even there? If, if that well, that's, there, <laughs> well, Paul, that's the legislation that I've introduced to do just that. Uh, right now, uh, if somebody is making $10 million a year, or somebody's a very, very wealthy person uh, like Mitt Romney, uh, he or she is contributing uh, the same amount of money into the Social Security Trust Fund as somebody who's making about $110,000. If you lift that cap and you start not at $110,000, but at $250,000, uh, you will basically uh, have full funding for Social Security for the next uh, 75 years. So, Paul, that is exactly the right solution to the Social Security issue. It's legislation that I've introduced, but more important, it is exactly what Barack Obama said four years ago, and some of us are trying very hard to have him say that again. We want to hear that again. Bradley in Spartansburg, South Carolina, watching us on Dish Network on Free Speech TV. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hello there, uh, Senator Sanders. I was wondering if uh, hasn't there been a lot of rating of the Social Security Fund, Medicare funds over the years to pay out of budget for the war and, for example, in Pakistan, uh, I mean, excuse me, not Pakistan, in Iraq, 
the Gulf War One, Gulf Iraq mm-hmm. Two, uh, Afghanistan. Well, Bradley, let me. The answer is yes and no. What happened when Lyndon Johnson was president? And it was a big mistake. But in order to hide the amount of money that was being spent on the Vietnam War, they merged the two trust funds. And they merged the Social Security Trust Fund into the general fund. But having said that, I think some people think, oh, they're just taking money out of the Social Security Trust Fund. They're spending it, and there's no money in the Social Security Trust Fund. That is absolutely not correct. Today, the Social Security Trust Fund has a surplus of $2.7 trillion. And what does happen, and you want it to happen, you don't want that money to be put under the president's mattress. You want that money invested in a safe way, which is United States Treasury bonds earning reasonably good interest. And that is uh, what is going on. So the Social Security Trust Fund is earning interest in T-bonds. But people should not conclude that there's no money in the Social Security Trust Fund. Uh, That is not the case. There is $2.7 trillion surplus, can pay out benefits for the next uh, 21 years. And that money is as safe as any other money in a nation which has not yet defaulted ever on any loans. And at the end of that 21 years? At the end of that 21 years, it will be able to pay out about 75 to 80 percent of benefits coming in because people will be contributing into Social Security. That money will be going out. It's that 20, 25 percent gap that has to be dealt with. Yeah, and that's where we, we lift the cap and solve the problem. Senator Bernie Sanders on the line with us, taking your calls in our national town hall meeting, Brunch with Bernie. He'll, we'll be right back with more of your calls for Senator Sanders. Big weekend to us that with that. That's right. that's what's coming up. That's what's coming up. Just a little while. Uh, it's our brunch at Bernie Hour. Al in San Antonio, Texas, listening on Sirius Satellite Radio. You are on the air with Senator Sanders. The financial crisis can be attributed, I think, to a great extent to the repeal of the Glass Steagall Act and also the Bucket Shop Law. Bucket Shop Law was put in 1907. Glass Steagall 1933. Both were repealed during the Clinton administration. Both have resulted in our current crisis. Why don't we? Put, why don't we put them back on the books? We should. Period. You're absolutely right. Uh, the idea that Wall Street, which is motivated by nothing else other than making as much money as they can for themselves in any way they can, <clears throat> including enormously complicated financial procedures, uh, illegal activity has got to be stopped. In fact, in my view, and I've been disappointed that the Democrats didn't talk about this terribly much at their convention, you are not going to have the kind of economy this country needs. You're not going to create the millions of jobs we have to create unless we deal with Wall Street. You cannot continue to have a handful of huge banks led by J.P. Morgan Chase with so much wealth and so much power. In my own view, you've got to stop breaking up these large financial institutions. At the very least, they need to be significantly re-regulated. And that's the point uh, that Al is making, and I agree with him. Rick in Seattle, listening on Talk 1090. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Uh, did you say Rick? Yes, sir. You're on the air. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it very much. It's just an honor to talk to you. I'm nervous, so let me get to my question. Uh, Bernie, I'm a mail carrier. I've been a mail carrier for 32 years. Um, we ha- we're wondering about early outs for the post office for the letter carriers. Let me explain why. The average age of a letter carrier is 53 years old. There's about 25,000 SERS employees left, which means we do not pay into the Social Security Fund. We, our overtime has just gone crazy. We are so understaffed. Why do they not offer an early retirement for letter carriers? Hiring veterans coming back from the war, we could hire 20,000, 30,000 people tomorrow at $10 less an hour and save a billion dollars a year. It makes perfect sense, and I so appreciate you being there. 
Well, Rick, thanks very much for that suggestion. Um, it's not an issue. Uh, that particular aspect of the postal situation is not one that I've studied, but it does make sense to me. But I will tell you the reason that something like that is not happening right now. As you, I am sure, know, Rick, and, and the letter carriers and the other postal workers fully understand this, that about a year ago the Postmaster General came up with a proposal uh, to uh, basically downsize the Postal Service by over 200,000 workers, shut half of the shut down half of the uh, post offices in America and half of the mail processing plants. So the idea of hiring new workers is not uh, what is on their agenda. It's rather downsizing in a very significant way. But your point is an interesting point and something I will look into. Anna Lisa in Carson City, Nevada. You're on the air, and thanks for watching us on Free Speech TV on Dish Network. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hi, Tom. Hi, Bernie. Hi. Bernie, I'd like to ask you a question. What did Senator Reid say to you when you suggested, why don't we do budget reconciliation now so we can pass things with a simple majority vote? Uh, well, I mean, you've asked a, a good question, and let me just answer it uh, in this way. Uh, I think, you know, the Democratic caucus uh, is a uh, very big tent. And you got some folks in that caucus uh, who are very reluctant to go in that direction, very reluctant to even deal with filibuster reform so that the Republicans uh, cannot continue to obstruct um, our efforts to try to pass significant legislation. But I will tell you this, Anna, I think more and more people, including the majority leader, uh, now believe that democracy is not being served. I believe very strongly minority has rights. Senate is not the House. And you've got to protect those rights. But on the other hand, it is totally absurd when demo democracy is perverted and majority rule is perverted by a minority. And that's certainly what has happened time after time after time during the last four years, and that has got to change. And I think you're seeing more and more people, including the majority leader, understand that. Peter in Lakewood, Ohio. We're two minutes out from the end of the show. Peter, quick question for, for Senator Sanders. Yeah, ju just an observation. Uh, 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 President Obama gave a hell of a speech yesterday. He's running a lot of commercials here uh, in, in Ohio, but I would like to see more emphasis uh, the connection with Congress, you know, if, if they tie the presidential campaign to the congressional campaign, we have to get that majority in Congress, but I don't hear anything. I, I mean, if he's going to get anything done, he has to have that majority. Why don't well, they Peter, tie the two Peter together? Peter raises a good point, and that has been a criticism uh, that people have made of the Obama campaign. For example, in Ohio, you have one of the outstanding members of the U.S. Senate, and that's Sherrod Brown. Uh, Sherrod is in a tough race. Uh, he needs all the help and support uh, that he can get, and that's true in many other parts of the country. The point that Peter is making is that the president can win, but if the Republicans control the House and the Senate, he is not, not going to get very much done. So we've got to focus not only on the presidential election, but on Senate races and House races as well. Bernie, we have just 45 seconds till the end here. Your thoughts on, on what people can be doing? And, and... Look, this is, Tom, a, a, a really is a pivotal moment uh, in American history. Uh, if the Republicans win, uh, I fear very much that along with Citizens United, along with the grotesquely unfair distribution of wealth and income that currently exists in this country, that we are going to be moving pretty rapidly toward, it, toward an oligarchic form of government where a handful of families, a uh, few hundred families, have just significant control of the economic and political life of this country. That's what's at stake right now. So now is not a time to despair, to throw your hands up in the air. Now is a time to work hard, get out on the streets, talk to people. Let's win this election. Uh, let's do what we can to retain and expand the Democratic majority in the Senate, reelect the president, regain control over the House, and then through grassroots organizing, make sure this president moves forward in a progressive direction. Amen to that. Senator Sanders, thanks so much for being with us today. Good to be with you, Tom.